This morning, we're going to start the book of 2 John. And of course, we had just finished 1 John. So now um, going into 2 John, John is going to kind of continue somewhat along the, the same theme that he focused on the first one, which really had a lot to do with love and an expression of love towards other saints. And he starts out really talking about this one who is the deceiver and who is the antichrist. So here in verse one, he's going to begin to talk about walking in the truth and seeing things as they really are. Because, of course, this is going to be something that we need to do when it comes to those who are contrary to the truth. He starts out with an expression of to the elect lady. And we see here in 1 John chapter, actually, let me get this context here. Uh, 2 John chapter 1, there is actually no chapter, so that's going to throw me off. Uh, so it's verse 1, actually. So uh, 2 John 1 the elder to the elect lady and to her children who I love in the truth and not only I but also all the ones experientially knowing the truth so he's beginning to first of course express that out so to the elect lady here more than likely in the context this would probably be actually referring to an assembly not to a specific uh, person it is, you know, kind of questionable as who he's referring to. But in the context, in the greater context of the book, I really do think he's focusing on the church. The actual term lady here, by the way, is the feminine form of Lord, which is quite interesting. So this would either be somebody of a very high ranking, which I don't think John is addressing a person like that. I really think he's addressing another assembly. And, and we get that by, the, of course, the fact that they are focusing on, well, as he's beginning to focus on living the doctrine of the Christ out. So John has a love for them in the truth, as we see in, as we saw in verse one. And of course, truth is seeing things as they really are. This is what um, John is expressing here. He very much wants to see things as they really are. Did you have a question? Um, so where is the specific assembly that he's addressing? It, um, there isn't a specific reference to where it's at. It's how he's actually addressing uh, when he says the elect lady. Now, why is that an assembly? Uh, the word ecclesia is feminine. So by using a feminine form of Lord, um, he does seem to be indicating a respect to another assembly in using it that way. But, but, we don't know what but we don't know which assembly it was. Okay. You know, and of course, right after First John, it very well could have been sent out to any assembly that receives it. You know, because it was a very heavy focus. Remember that First John was very heavily focused on loving one another because the church in Ephesus had forgotten that. You know, they, they were very good at holding to the truth and putting people to the test. And... Um, their focus just kind of got off the love of the brethren. And it was a very big problem because that, of course, is our primary, uh, it's always our primary focus. So now I know there are some commentaries that'll say that he's speaking to some unknown lady who is of great uh, uh, political power or something along those lines. But I don't really see that in the context here because he's going to begin to talk about those who are in the assembly, and he refers to them as, their, as her children. Now, of course, John not only says, you know, that he himself is, actually has a love for them in truth, but that also those who experientially know the truth. You know, the truth is, as John focuses on this, you know, remember the truth abides into the age. And we see this in 2 John chapter, or 2 John verse 2. It says, because the truth, the one abiding in us, is also with us into the age. And so what he's expressing here is seeing things as they really are. And of course, it relates to really us as a church and the things that we have. That is going to abide into the age. He doesn't actually say forever. There's some of the translations that will say forever. 
But the truth that is being presented right now is a truth, and especially in the context of 2 John, relates to the Christian life. Now, that is actually going to abide into the age, you know, as we actually uh, manifest who we are in Christ. But it will come eventually to a point to where the church is in heaven. And the church being in heaven, we're not going to be manifesting that life in the same way because we're not going to be around anything that's unrighteous. We ourselves are not going to be unrighteous. So it is a truth that actually abides into us. It is the truth that we receive from the beginning. You know, and John very much emphasizes this. John chapter 13 and verse 34. This is the truth that he's talking about, what we as Christians are to actually do for our commandment. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. And if we really understand what Jesus is saying there, by giving us a new commandment, he is not adding a commandment to the Ten Commandments. He's putting us under a different standard. Loving one another, when we're actually doing that, we will never violate any quality of law, whether it's the Mosaic Law or any other law, because we're expressing love towards others. We also see over in John chapter 15, where Jesus is talking about the fact that he's using the vine and the branches as an example here, but he's talking about the fact that unless we're abiding in Christ, now remember in Christ is that new creation in which we, of course, at the church are the body and Christ is the head. That new creation makes it possible for us to be ones who are seen before God as not being condemned. We're now righteous before God. And we can, of course, act accordingly. But apart from that position, we can't produce anything of any value. Now, that means a Christian who is carnal, who is focused on the flesh, will not produce good works. They might appear to be good, but the reality is their underlying reason for doing them is selfish. And it's about either showing one's righteousness to God through their own works, or showing it to some other, some other person, or there's some other motive that's wrong behind it, is really what it would be. So in John chapter 15, verse 1 and 3, he talks about this, I am the vine dresser, and my father is the, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and remember that concept of take away, literally means to lift up. I have heard so many bad interpretations of this particular passage because i want to say you'll lose your salvation but that word take away does not mean that and if you really understand vine dressing you're a one who is a or a farmer or one who's a, the vine keeper how whatever you call them, what there's a term for them and it's jumping out of my brain anyway the guy that takes care of the vines um when you come across a particular branch that's down in the mud, what are you going to do? You're going to clean it up and you're going to pin it up so that it can actually start to produce because it can't produce down in the mud. Now, that would be a very good example for us as Christians when we're wallowing in our sins. And we need to actually be lifted out from those. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it. So even when we begin to grow and produce fruit, he's going to clip off areas in our life that they're not necessarily bad, but he wants us to produce fruit in a certain area that's a high quality fruit. And we need to remember that. He doesn't want us scattered into too many different areas. So he's going to care about us in the sense that he's going to prune off areas that we, we don't really need to worry about so that we can focus on really the areas in the fruit that he wants us to produce. That they may bear much fruit and you are already clean because I have spoken this word to you. And then of course he goes on to the fact that you abide in me and I in you, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And of course that abiding term has to do with feeling at ease. That abiding term is not referencing to ones who are not in Christ. Okay, it's a little bit different in the way that's actually expressed there. 
So the truth, as I said, it is a truth that does not change. It abides into the age. And that's so important for us as Christians to remember. Truth is something that is not relative. It doesn't change. I have heard so many times people try to say that the, that the church today just, you know, what they're presenting just isn't for today. But the reality is that's because they're not presenting the truth. The truth is the truth, no matter what age it is. And we need to focus on that. And it's the one that's going to abide. And of course, you know, when it comes to a lie, what happens to lies in relation to the Christian life and other things like that? They fade away, don't they? Can you remember a few of the lies most recently? I do. The purpose-driven life. Well, that was built upon a lie. Oh, how can I see that? say that? Read the book. Find what he says about how you're actually saved. Rick Warren, I do believe is the author of that, says that you are saved by making Jesus your friend. Find me a passage in scripture that says that. I'll give you one, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, that very clearly states that we are saved by believing that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. The prayer of Jabez to, to make you more wealthy. These are all false, but the truth actually continues to abide. And then he also goes on to talk about grace, mercy, and peace. Verse 3 says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God, the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. Grace, of course, is God's attitude whereby he gives us a benefit without consideration of merit. This is something that's continually with us as Christians. This is the way that God is going to interact with us all the time. It's he is going to, his attitude towards us doesn't look at whether we deserve it or not. He's going to give us the benefit regardless. Mercy, of course, is a relief from the effects of sin. And giving us that relief from those impacts of our sin as we actually are cleanse ourselves and, and walk away from that kind of stuff, start to grow and mature. And then peace here would be an unruffledness of mind. We as Christians should have an unruffled mind. That is, what's going on in the world system today and all the, the turmoil is not something that should impact our mind. It shouldn't because... God already told us exactly what's going to happen. And God has already shown in multiple occasions that he truly is the only one that can say things as they really are. And he does what he says he'll do. So our mind should not be ruffled. Now, of course, it needs to be in truth and in love, seeing things as they really are. And then that love, especially among the brethren, where we are expressing I care for another person. We're looking or seeking the best for another one. That is actually the kind of love that he's talking about here. And then here he goes on to talk about the fact that he's finding those who are walking in the truth. This is in verse 4 where he says, I exceedingly rejoice that I found out from your children, walking in, uh, found out ones from your children, is kind of the way he's expressing this, um, so I exceedingly rejoice that I found out from your children, walking ones in the truth, just as we received commandment from the Father. It's, it's a little stilted in the way that I translated that, but that's partly because he doesn't just say, hey, you know, I, I heard they were walking in the truth. He actually uses a, a term that means to characterize somebody as one who is walking in the truth. That would be his focus there. So this, it, the general characteristic of these particular people are ones who look at the truth and then apply it to their lives and start living their life according to the truth. That's the way he's kind of expressing a little bit stronger than just saying they're walking. And they are walking, of course, according to the commandment that was given to us. And over in 1 John, John talks about this. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Start out with believing. Now, of course, if you're believing on the name of Jesus Christ, 
understand what that means. That means you are believing on the character of this one who is Jesus Christ. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus, this Jesus, actually came in the flesh and died for our sins. This Jesus, God actually raised from the dead, showing that we are righteous before him. We believe that. That's what we believe about him. And love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandment abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that we abide, that he abides in us by the spirit which he, or whom he gave us. And that would be verse 24. Feeling at ease with who we are in Christ. That's what he's talking about with that abiding. And we need to, of course, continue to love one another and continue in that love. As he um, goes on in verse 5, he expresses this. And here he says, And now I ask you, lady, not as a new commandment while writing to you, but that which I received from the beginning in order that you should love one another. Now, Paul, or excuse me, John here is actually, the way that he says um, this word ask, he's really saying, I'm asking you as an equal. He is not using his position of an apostle to demand something. He's actually using his position as a fellow saint. And the way that he's expressing this to this, and I really think it's an assembly in the context here is asking as one who is, a, is also equal with them, or they are equal with him. And it's not a new commandment he's actually giving. You know, and he expressed this prior in, again, 1 John, where he says, I'm not giving you a new commandment. I'm actually giving you a commandment that we got from the very beginning. 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, Brother and I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning, the old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Now, don't stop there and say, oh, well, that's the Ten Commandments. That's not the Ten Commandments. That's not what he's talking about. Again, a new commandment I write to you because we did actually receive a new commandment, didn't we? And he goes on, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. And of course, what is this new commandment? That we love one another. That we have that um, attitude towards other saints where we are actually seeking the best for those saints and learning to grow and mature in that. Now remember, you know, when it comes to how we actually love God, you know, saying that you love God is not actually an expression of love. Saying that you love God could be the result of an expression of love. But how we actually love God is through our actions. Verse 6, and this is the love. In order that we should walk according to his commandment, that is the commandment just as you all heard from a beginning, in order that in it all of you should walk. Now in the context, what John is talking about is loving one another. If you actually want to show love towards God, you are going to walk in the commandment that he gave us. Or another way of saying that, and, he, and John very clearly said this in the book of 1 John, if you are indifferent towards a brother, how can you actually love God who you've never seen? We love God by loving the brethren. And that's really important for us as Christians to understand. We want to walk in his commandments. And again, he goes back to, this is the one you received from the beginning. I'm not giving you something new. Right back to the beginning of the church. And now Paul is going, uh, Paul, stuck on Paul. Uh, now John is going to go into talking about the deceivers and the antichrists. You know, and these who are actually among us. There are many deceivers that have come into the world. Now, John is writing this quite a few thousand years ago, well, almost 2,000 years ago is about when this was written. And at that point, he's saying, many, many deceivers have come into this world. Verse 7 goes on and says, because many deceivers have entered the world, 
neither uh, never confessing Jesus Christ, the one having come in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist, the one who does not ever confess. That is, that word confessing, of course, is going to be making a verbal agreement. And what are they agreeing on? That Jesus is the Messiah? You know, he is the one who actually came in the flesh. Jesus Christ is the one who was promised to Israel. They're never going to agree to that. They're not, never going to agree with God that that is actually what or who Jesus Christ is. They are the ones who cause the saints to wander. We see an example of this over in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18. That deceiver, that word deceiver actually means one who is a wanderer. And if you put that into a noun, that means one who causes others to wander. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure those, allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. In the context, Peter's talking about Christians who have actually grown in their Christian life, and they've escaped this doing of wrong that relates to the world system. But yet we have these who, through swelling words and, and emptiness, they come back and this lewdness. Now, lewdness is a word that we kind of think, you know, um, it's kind of rude. But really, if you actually look at what it's talking about, it's talking about an unrestricted lifestyle. And where do you see this the most in? The prosperity gospel. People who think you should have wealth and, and just flaunt your wealth because that's exactly what they're doing. And all they're doing is taking money from those who actually need it and trying to say that somehow that God is actually going to bless them for doing that. And that is completely contrary to scripture. They're going to lead people astray. As the end nears, more and more of these are going to come. We're going to have a whole lot of them. As a matter of fact, you know, we are in the Laodicean church period. And the Laodicean church period described over in Revelations is a period in which the church is lukewarm to Jesus. You think about that. Yeah, they'll, they'll use his name, but they don't actually care one way or the other. We got to be very cautious of that. And the reason is because we have a lot of deceivers today. First Timothy chapter four and verse one talks about this. Now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now the doctrines of demons kind of sounds like, oh, really bad stuff. And people are going to go over to the, to the church of Satan. Well, if you actually understand the church of Satan, it, it has nothing to do with Satan. It's the church of the flesh. It's all about the desires of the flesh. You know, they don't even understand, honestly, they do not even understand the being that they claim to actually worship. It's so absurdly ridiculous when you understand the facts. And that's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about is teaching that is demonic. Well, what is teaching that is demonic? Living by the Mosaic law is a demonic teaching. Salvation by any other means than believing that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day is a demonic teaching. It doesn't actually use the word doctrine here. It uses the word teaching. And when you understand the distinction between those two, doctrine is for practice. Teaching is for learning, but not putting into practice. See, all scripture is beneficial for the saint today. But not all scripture is for our practice. But demonic teaching is going to take that information that is not meant for practice, and it's going to put it into practice. And typically, what does it do in that case? It has to allegorize it. I mean, look at Matthew chapter 5 verses, uh, or well, 5 through 7, those chapters. How, oh, the allegorization of those passages is just ridiculous. And what some people will say about those, are, it's just absurd. Because the reality is those aren't for us today. They don't fit in with other doctrines. We are righteous before God in Christ. 
we are ones who actually have a mind that we can understand. It's so distinctly different what we have, but they don't want to actually do that. And then, of course, the cutting off of the body part, they'll allegorize that. No, today we don't cut off body parts. Don't, don't misinterpret that. But during the millennial kingdom, it's either that or going to the lake of fire. But you got to understand the circumstances that they're in. The local assembly is to place that which should is really a place where saints should come and grow so that they are not ones who are caused to wander. That's the purpose of the church is for the edification of the saints. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14 talks about this. Now, in the context here, it's talking about the fact that, that Christ has given gifts to men. And it talks about the apostles, the evangelists, the pastor, even teacher. And he's given to them so that we come to a oneness of the faith. That word unity does not mean that we all just kind of get together and ignore our differences. No, that word unity means a singleness or oneness of faith because there is only one faith. Now, remember, faith is always based upon a promise. Now, people kind of tend to use that word faith really loosely. You know, they'll say that, you know, the Muslims have a faith, but they don't actually have a faith because they don't have a promise from God. They'll say that the same thing with the Mormons and, and other false religions where they have a faith. But no, that's actually not a faith because faith is always based upon a promise. Always based upon a promise. So on this one, the doctrine word is actually the teaching word. Yes, actually. Mean? Yes, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, it's talking about not being shifted around by all of this teaching, but actually able to properly understand Old Testament doctrine and how it's to be applied to, the, to today for a Christian. Because it's not something we live out. What is the one, what is the biggest thing we learn from the Old Testament for our Christian life today? What not to do. You know, and the biggest not to do thing that you should be pulling out of the Old Testament is when God says something, do it. Stop saying, oh, no, we'll do it our own way. So it's not being carried around by every wind of the teaching. That is, by the trickery of men and the cunning um, and cunning craftiness, for the purpose of deceiving people. That's what it's actually designed to do: is deceive people. And the reality is, it is all about getting your money. That's what it comes down to. You know, that is not what the church is for today. We have a oneness of faith, a singleness of faith, and we are ones who the church, the whole purpose of the church is so that we grow and we mature and we're able to identify information that we are to put into practice and information we're to understand but not put into practice and properly use those. But the deceiver, he doesn't want us doing that. And then, of course, we have the Antichrist also. Remember, the Antichrist is is one who is described as who is against Christ. Oftentimes, the Antichrist is mixed up with a man of lawlessness, and this is not, uh, not an accurate interpretation of that. The man of lawlessness is one who refuses to abide by any quality of law. The Antichrist is one who stands against Christ. <clears throat> First John chapter 2 and verse 18. Little children is the last hour. And you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. There's a whole lot of people out there that are, that are speaking against Christ. And like I said, this, this, this term is often used to describe the man of lawlessness by false teachers. It is not something you want to uh, mix those two up with. They're two completely different things. Is, is John the only one who uses this term? John is the only one who actually uses the term Antichrist. Yes. Actually, no, nobody else uses the term Antichrist. And the man of lawlessness is specifically from Paul, is where we get that. 
And in the context, you can clear you can clearly see that John is not talking about the man of lawlessness. John is talking about uh, those who are now today who deny the deity of Christ. First John chapter four and verse three talks about that. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. He's already there. But with this in mind, John tells them to, to glance at themselves, pay a little bit of attention to themselves. In verse 8, he says, all of you, glance at yourselves in order that you do not destroy that which we worked, but receive a full wage. You don't want somebody to come and be deceiving you in such a way that you're actually going to ruin the work that you've already done. And it's so sad to see that happen to Christians, but oftentimes it does. Remember, we are the ones who are to walk in the truth and seeing things as they really are. When it comes to the deceiver and the Antichrist, they are ones who are contrary to that. They want to deceive us. They want to make us wander away from the truth, not seeing things as they really are. The Antichrist is anybody against Christ. Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses. Well, the list is huge, actually. Because... You know, typically we want to say cults like the Mormons, but what about a Baptist church who isn't preaching the truth? Or a Pentecostal church, which has nothing to do with the truth at all, Pentecostal, charismatic. Why do we have so many different so-called denominations in Christianity today? There is only one truth. There is only one church. It's because of these deceivers and these antichrists that have come into the world and they're leading people astray. And we don't want to be actually caught up with them. You know, and sadly, a lot of times, you know, in our lives, sometimes we don't really see it because they're good at deceiving. Which means we need to be in an assembly where we are actually learning the truth and we are actually growing so that we truly can identify things that are false. You don't want to be in an assembly that's trying to teach you about the false things. You want to be in an assembly that's teaching you the truth. Because the best way to identify something that is false is by knowing the truth. So the next section that John is going to go into is the doctrine of the Christ. But we're going to uh, reserve that for next week because we, we're going to break for a communion at this point. <clears throat>